The culmination of Ursula K. Le Guin's fourth Earthsea novel, Tahanu, comes with the revelation of who this child Theru is and that she is in fact the Tahanu that is named in that very work. And the book begins with her and ends with her. It begins in complete passivity and ruin. She is nearly dead. And it ends with a revelation of who and what she really is. So Theru, a name that is given to her by Tenar, who becomes her adoptive mother, a Kargish name that means burning, uh, is a horribly abused, traumatized, and scarred child who nearly dies after being thrown into a fire after her abusers, her mother and father and two other men, have raped her, malnourished her, beaten her nearly to death, thrown her into a fire to conceal their crimes. She's brought to, to Lark, who then gives her to Tenar, and she's been terribly maimed. Her entire right side of her face is ruined, burned down to the bone, the eye gone, and the same with her right hand as well. It's essentially a claw. She is at the same time as she grows, they find a person with power and nobody's quite sure what to make of this. Ogian in dying is going to use his dying words to tell um, Tenar what she needs to do to teach her, to teach Theru. Uh, it's not clear what that teaching means and there's actually a lot of space devoted to Tenor's own thoughts and quest to, to find ways to teach Theru. But he also says they will fear her. And when Tenar is talking with Ivy, a witch, about taking Tenar on as an apprentice, Ivy says, I won't do it. And Tenar says, well, why not? And Ivy says, I'd be afraid to. And Tenar says, well, what are you afraid of? A child, an ill-used child. And then Tenar thinks maybe it's because of her loss of virginity. She says, must apprentice witch be a virgin then? And Ivy says, that's not what I mean. I mean, I don't know what she is. When she looks at me with that one eye seeing and one blind, I don't know what she sees. I see you go about with her like she was any other child. And I think, what are they? What's the strength of that woman for she's not a fool to hold a fire by the hand to spin thread with the whirlwind. They say, mistress, that you lived as a child yourself with the old ones, the dark ones, the ones underfoot, and you were queen and servant to those powers. Maybe that's why you're not afraid of this one. What power she is, I don't know. I don't say, but it's beyond my teaching. I know that or beaches or any other witch or wizard I ever knew. I give you my advice, mistress, free and fearless. It's this, beware, beware her the day she finds her strength. That's all. So this is a person of power saying, eh, I'm not going to mess with that myself. I, I don't know how you do it, Tenar. Um, the other thing that comes up early on that we should probably bring up, there is this wonderful story that Tenar tells to Theru as they are climbing the way to Realbi to go see sick Ogian. They don't realize at that point that he's dying. And she tells her, this is a story that Ogian told me about a woman who was actually a dragon. The woman of Kame, you know, reveals herself as something. She doesn't say exactly whether she's a woman putting on dragon's form or a dragon putting on a woman's form or something different. And she tells the story of the origin of both human beings and dragons from the time that Segoy brought up the islands from the sea. There's other foreshadowing that takes place in this story before we get to the final chapter. Theru's response to hearing the word Kalesin, after Kalesin, the great dragon, the oldest of the dragons, has brought Ged to, um, to Tenar to be taken home, to be tended, hopefully to see Ogion. Unfortunately, Ogion is dead by then. And 
Um, this is, this is uh, the, th- the three women, Moas, Heather, and Tenar talking together, and then Theru is there as well. And Tenar is trying to say what happened to her. She tried to say the word dragon and could not. Her lips and tongue would not form the word, but a word formed itself with them, making itself with her mouth and breath. Kalesin, she said. Theru was staring at her. A wave of warmth, heat, seemed to flow from the child as if she were in fever. She said nothing but moved her lips as if repeating the name, and that fever heat burned about her. This is a foreshadowing of what's going on. Theru is responding on a very basic level, a bodily level, to this name that somehow she knows. There's also some interesting speculation about how Theru sees the world. We saw Ivy talks about that. Tenor herself is going to bring that up as well. And this will uh, be quite interesting. So she's, she's brushing her hair, combing her hair, and she asks, uh, here we go, Theru came to stand behind her watching. Tenor turned and saw her so intense she was almost trembling. What is it, birdlet? The fire flying out, the child said, with fear or exultation all over the sky. It's just the sparks from my hair, Tenor said, a little taken aback. Theru was smiling, and she did not know if she'd ever seen the child smile before. Thera reached out both her hands, the whole one in the burned, as if to touch and follow the flight of something around Tenar's loose floating hair. The fire is all flying out, she repeated, and she laughed. At that moment, Tenar asked herself how Theru saw her, saw the world, and knew she did not know, that she could not know what one saw with an eye that had been burned away. And Ogian's words, they will fear her return to her, but she felt no fear of the child. Instead, she brushed her hair again vigorously so the sparks would fly. And once again, she heard the little husky laugh of delight. Theru is seeing the world in a different way, through a different eye, you could say. Um, A little bit later, this is actually in chapter 12, there's an interesting uh, discussion. The burned and deformed side of her face was made rigid by the destruction of muscles and the thickness of the scar surface. But as the scars got older and as tenor learned by long usage not to look away from it as deformity, but to see it as face, it had expressions of its own. When Thera was frightened, the burned and darkened side closed in, as tenor thought, drawing together hardening. When she was excited or intent, even the blind eye socket seemed to gaze, and the scars reddened and were hot to touch. Now, as she went out, there was a queer look to her, as if her face were not human at all, an animal, some strange, horny-skinned, wild creature with one bright eye, silent, escaping. So this is, uh, you know, another prefiguration as well, we could say. And we have uh, yet another one in um, talking about wanting to fly. Now, this is in a world where only birds and dragons fly. I suppose wizards can as well, generally transforming themselves into you know, a bird or a dragon to do so. Theru t- is talking to Ged. Her face scarred and whole, Seeing and blind was intent fiery. The king came in a ship. He had a sword. He gave me the bone dolphin. His ship was flying, but I was sick because Handy touched me. But the king touched me there and the mark went away. She showed her round, thin arm. Tenor stared. She'd forgotten the mark. Someday I want to fly to where he lives, Theru told Ged. He nodded. I will do that, she said. Do you know him? So this is interesting. Could fly mean sail? Or does fly really mean fly? Ged is is nodding along. It's not quite clear what, what she actually does mean. We find out what's actually going on in the final chapter. There's a little bit of just before the final chapter where we see that um, Theru turns aside precisely because um, she realizes that her mother and father are going the wrong way. Um, Tenor has been bewitched. So um, 
Here we go. To the left were the roofs of Ray Albee slanting down towards the cliff edge. To the right, the road that went up to the manor house. This way, Tenor said. No, the child said, pointing left to the village. This way, Tenor repeated and went off on the right-hand way. Ged came with her. And this is where they run into the evil wizard, uh, Aspen, of Ray Albee. Theru has gone off, and here we go. The child turned left and went some way before she looked back, letting the blossoming hedgerow hide her. And now we get to see how she, in fact, sees part of the world. The one called Aspen, whose name was Erisen, whom she saw as a forked and writhing darkness, had bound her mother and father with a thong through her tongue and a thong through his heart and was leading them up toward the place where he hid. The smell of the place was sickening to her, but she followed a little way to see what he did. He led them in and shut the door behind him. It was a stone door. She could not enter there. And now what do we read? She needed to fly, but she could not fly. She was not one of the winged ones. So she runs and she goes to Auntie Moss's house to find out what's going on with Auntie Moss. And she finds Moss is indeed very, very sick, but it's a sickness brought about by wizardry. The old woman was hiding in her bed. She says, um, he made my flesh rot and shrivel and rot again, but he won't let me die. He said, I'd bring you here. I tried to die. I tried, but he held me. He held me living against my will. He won't let me die. And Thero says, well, you shouldn't die. And then she, the, the old woman says, child, dearie, call me by my name. Hatha, the child says. Now notice that within the space of two pages, this child knows the true names, not only of the witch who's never repeated it to her, and of Aspen, who definitely would not have revealed his true name to her. And then she, uh, Moss says, set me free, dearie. And Thero says, I have to wait till they come. Till who come, dearie, Moss says, my people. Who are her people? Well, we find out when, um, here we go. Tenor couldn't point, couldn't speak, but pointed to the sky above the sea. Where this is when they're about to have Ged fall off of the cliff. Albatross, he said. She laughed aloud. In the gulfs of light from the doorway of the sky, the dragon flew fire trailing behind the coiled mailed body. Tenar spoke then. She's able to break the spell. Kalesin, she cried, and then turned, seizing Ged's arm, pulling him down to the rock. As the roar of fire went over them, the rattle of mail and the hiss of wind in upraised wings, the clash of the talons like Sith blades on the rock. The evil wizard of Rayalbi and his followers have all been destroyed by Kalesin the dragon. Ged was beside her. They were crouched side by side, the sea behind them and the dragon before them. It looked at them sidelong from one long ye yellow eye. Ged spoke in a hoarse, shaking voice in the dragon's language. Tenor understood the words, which were only, Our thanks, eldest. Looking at Tenor, Kalesian spoke in the huge voice of a broom of metal dragged across a gong. Aro tehanu? The child, Tenor said. Theru. She got to her feet to run to seek her child. She saw her coming down the ledge of rock between the mountain and the sea towards the dragon. Don't run, Thero, she cried. But the child had seen her and was running, running straight to her. They clung to each other. Tahanu, the dragon said. The child looked, turned to look at it. Kalesin, she said. Then Ged, who had remained kneeling, stood up, though shakily catching Tenar's arm to steady himself. He laughed. Now I know who called you, eldest. He's talking to the dragon. And then Ther Theru says, or Tahanu says something really, really important. I did. I did not know what else to do. Segoy. Kalesin is Segoy. This is a massive revelation in the world of Earthsea. Kalesin, the oldest of dragons, is the one who created. Earth, sea itself. So he, Kalesin, whether male or female or neither, is not merely a dragon, not the oldest of the dragons, but the oldest of beings, and has named Theru uh, Tahanu, his, his daughter. 
He says to her, it was well, child, I have sought thee long. And then uh, Thera says, shall we go there now where the others are on the other wind? And Calessian says, would you leave these? And Thera says, no, can they not come? They cannot come. Their life is here. I will stay with them, she said with a little catch of breath. Calessian turned aside to give that immense furnace blast of laughter, contempt, or delight, or anger. Ha! Then looking at the child, it is well, thou hast work to do here. I know, the child said. I will come back for thee, Calessian said, in time. And to get in Tenar, I give you my child as you will give me yours. In time, Tenar said. Calessian's great head bowed very slightly, and the long sword-tooth mouth curled up at the corner. Ged and Tenar drew aside with Thero as the dragon turned, dragging its armor across the ledge, placing its talent feet carefully, gathering its black haunches like a cat, till it sprang aloft. So they, they go on, and Ged says, um, Her native tongue, her mother tongue, Tahanu, said Tenor, her name is Tahanu. She has been given it by the giver of names. She has been Tahanu since the beginning. Always she has been Tahanu. We know now what Theru was and is, and we see her restored. She still remains the scarred child, but now with her identity coming to light, everything can be worked upon, can be fixed, and there is more stories yet to come as a result.